Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. We kindly ask you to invite someone to join you in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you may be. Call somebody. Ask them to tune in because we are going to another wonderful session where we will eat the manna from heaven, the inspired word of God. The life changing, life breathing, word of God. Remember at creation, God got the clay and molded it and breathed into it. And man became a living being. That breath of God comes to us now through the inspired word of God. Remember Jesus says in John chapter 6 verse 63 it says it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And says the words that I speak to you they are spirit and they are life. So today, we are having an encounter with life through the word of God. Get somebody to join you and your life will not be the same again. So before we open up today's session, let's take this moment and dedicate this session before God in prayer and God will do us well. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you. Yes, Lord. Have your way in us today. Yes, Lord. Reveal Jesus. Yes, Lord. Magnify Jesus. Yes, Lord. Let your word come alive. Mm. Open our hearts. Mm. Let it come forth in might, mm. in strength, mm. in wisdom, mm. instruction, mm. and direction. Yes, Lord. To rebuke us. Yes, Lord. To correct us. Mm. To edify us. Yes, Lord. That Jesus Christ mm. may be revealed. Yes, Lord. And we may be perfected mm. for the work of ministry. Mm. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Today we will take our reading from the book of Romans chapter 5. Unlike the previous one, where we handled verse 1 to verse 5, but we emphasized on verse 1. Today we are reading verse 1 and verse 2. Because like I said the last time round, we saw the overview. So the overview, that is the reason we had to go through the entire three, five verses. And it is that overview that gives us the five benefits that we receive when we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Having seen that overview, we then focused on the first benefit, which comes to us in chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 2, 
the Bible says, Bible through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope in the glory of God. So let's look at having articulated the first the five benefits we have. We looked at the first benefit, which is the peace with God. And we saw that it is different from the peace of God. The peace of God is that inner tranquility that you have. It is that state of mind, that calm posture that is derived internally. And that is what happens in spite of what is happening around you. So, so when the storms of life begin to swirl around you, this is what I have found out. That sometimes the Lord will come and deliver you out of it. But sometimes God will deliver you through it. So how does he do that? He calms you down and lets the storm rage. And once the storm has passed, you will be still standing. And this happens to many of us where God allows us to go through the storms of life. He lets them rage. He calms us down. And over time, the storm soon passes and we're still standing with the testimony of God's faithfulness. The peace that we are talking about is the peace with God. The scripture says, therefore having been justified by faith, we have presently, we do have. Why? Because we were justified. So we have peace with God. And this peace is not without a foundation. This peace is through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we come to Jesus Christ, he unleashes or unveils a package for us. And this package comes with benefits to the believer. And we saw the first benefit to the believer. It says we have peace with God. Now, peace with God supposes that there was a time or there was a moment in the life of the believer when this peace did not exist. When this peace with God was not in existence. It speaks of a state of war. It speaks of a state of conflict. But thanks be to God that through our Lord Jesus Christ, and I told you he achieved this through his sinless life, through which he fulfilled all the the requirements of the law and through his death and it is through his death then that he meets the justice requirements of a just God and having met all those requirements he purchases for us he purchases for us 
this freedom that we have. He purchases for us this peace that we have with God. And we looked at three aspects that detail what happened. The first one is propitiation. And propitiation means the satisfaction. So what happened is that the anger of God was appeased. It was satiated. It was satisfied through the redemption the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, after propitiation, then we have the other bit, which is redemption. He then bought us, and that carries the idea of a slave market. And we, as being slaves to sin, through the redemption work of Jesus Christ, we were bought from the sin market. Having bought us out of the sin market, we are sanctified. We are cleansed by his blood. And having then been cleansed by his blood, something important happens, which is the third aspect we talked about, and which is redemption, which is reconciliation. He now reconciles men that were sinful that have now been washed by his blood, that are now his own, he brings them and reconciles them with a holy God. So now you and I stand before God with that peace. And the Bible says he himself has become our peace. And this is not just to the Jew but the Gentiles also. And we'll be looking at that in detail in today's sermon. Today, we will look at verse 2. The Bible says, through whom also, and the through whom who are they talking about? The one they are talking about is the one of verse 1. Jesus Christ our Lord. Whom we encountered at the end of verse 1. So the Bible tells us that through him, not anybody else, through him, that places Jesus as the only way to have access to God. It is the only way through whom we can be justified. So he just does not only justify us. But he introduces us to God. He draws us into the presence of God. And it is here that we can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So when he says in another portion of scripture that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. This is cemented here because you cannot have access to because to get to God you need a mediator. And Paul explains to us that there is one God and one mediator between men and God. The man, Jesus Christ. So he is alone. Is God enough 
katonda mubu juvu. To draw God to us. Uh, to sembe uh, zekatoa uh, utule tete katonda. And man enough. Era sigalai ra muntu unga To bring men. And unite them with the Holy God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture says, through him also. There are other versions which says, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith. Now, let's look at, the, and they're both the same thing. If we look at the word introduction, I believe there have been moments in your life where you have met somebody you did not know. And in order to overcome those first moments, where you are meeting someone you have never met before. I know for some, for some of you it's so easy, but for some people it's quite hard to introduce yourself to a stranger. Now, here is something beautiful. We are introduced by faith to the presence of God through Jesus Christ. It is like Jesus himself introducing us to the Father. Introducing us to a to the loving Father. Introducing us to his presence. But that is mind-boggling when you think about it. The scripture says, through him also, and I love the also bit. Because the also means it, he is adding to what we have already encountered in verse 1. It is like saying you not only have peace with God, but along with the peace with God, you also now we have access with God. So you have access with God based on the fact that you and I have peace with God. And this has been brokered by Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you and I do not need another mediator to access God. You and I do not need any other individual. You don't have to pray through a saint. You, you, you don't have to go kicking around, breaking through principalities and powers. In order for you to access God. No, you have access by faith. You have access by faith. So it's the same faith that brought you to Christ. The same faith that saves you. It is the same faith that draws you into the presence of God. Now here, Paul introduces something strange. He says access by faith into the grace. He's talking about grace. And when we talk about grace, we are talking about favor. That is not merited. It is favor that comes to us. Not based on our achievements. Not based on our merit. It is favor that comes to us. Based on the finished work of another. So we are beneficiaries. Of that which we do not labor for. 
so we come to a position before God where we are accepted not based on what we have done but based on what Jesus Christ has done and it is this access that you and I irrespective of our background, irrespective of what we have done, when we believe in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, through whom also, we, not we the, el we the elite, not we the pastors, no, not we the apostles. It doesn't say we the prophets. Who are the we he's talking about here? He's talking about all believers, not just the upper tier. Everyone. Bona have obtained this privilege. Everyone comes to get this access. And let's look at it briefly and dwell some more along it so that you understand it. Uh, let's look, take a step back and look at the word through whom. And look at other aspects in the Bible where this comes to us. And the first one that comes to us is found in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 18. This is what the Bible says. It says through him and the him refers to Jesus Christ. We have access. So we have access in one spirit to the Father. So we come to the Father through the Son in the Spirit. So it is the Spirit that draws us to the Father. And the only way we can access the Father is by coming to Him through the Son. So you cannot access God based on Abraham, based on Isaac, based on Jacob. No, you cannot access God based on who your father was or, or who your mother was. I have had people who say, uh, the God of my father, my and they are talking about their physical fathers, spiritual fathers. And it doesn't work here. We access him. We have this access through Jesus Christ. And him alone. So this is privileged access. It means without him, there is no way you can access God. So it is through him, and it is him that gives you access to the Spirit, who then draws you to the presence of the Father. And this is the way we approach the Father in prayer. This is the way we approach the Father. In praise and worship. And this is the way we approach the Father. When we are to have fellowship with Him. So you cannot have fellowship with the Father without this channel. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, in whom, again talking about Jesus Christ, we have boldness and comfort. So we are not going there as timid people. We are not going there and with the anticipation of 
something evil befalling us. We are not going to the Father, not sure of who we are approaching. No, we go boldly and with confidence. So we have bold and confident access through faith in Him. It is Jesus Christ that introduces us. I am reminded of a scripture where he warns his disciples and says, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my father and his angels. It is him that introduces us. With him we have unfettered access access to the Father. That is why as believers, we have a unique privilege that we are able to access the presence of God. The writer of Hebrews quotes the same and says, therefore, let's approach with boldness the throne of grace and mercy. He calls it the throne of grace. He calls it the throne of mercy. He's basically telling us this is what you will find when you get there. You will not find their condemnation. What you will find when you approach this throne, you will find mercy. Mercy takes away the guilt that you have. When you approach this throne, you are going to find grace. It's amazing the right of Hebrews that does not say let's approach the throne of God. He says, approach the throne of grace and mercy. To help you. Why? Because you and I to go through what we are to go through every day of our lives. We need help. And this help comes in the form of the blessing of God. What blessing are we talking about? His mercy which takes away what you deserve and then his grace which gives you what you don't deserve. So he says approach the throne of grace and mercy and obtain mercy and obtain grace to help you in your time of need. Do you have a need? You need God's mercy. You need God's grace. And when you get that, you find it with the Father. How do you access the Father? The Bible says through whom also. We have access into this grace in which we stand. So it is by faith alone in Christ alone that we have access to the Father. So we don't go to the Father fighting our way. No, we don't. We don't. There are no principalities, powers, what to kick and fight our way to the Father. No. Then that ceases to be grace. You get there by your own effort. No, we access the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. 
So, so into this grace, Paul wants us to understand that none of us can of ourselves and in ourselves come to the presence of God the Father. So grace is free. Grace is God's free, unmerited, undeserved favor. That God extends to an unworthy, undeserving sinner. Let me say it again. Grace is God's free. Katonda unmerited and deserved favor which he extends to an unworthy undeserving sinner. So it is God's justifying work that he now transfers to you. So basically, you are moved from the realm in which you previously operated. Now you begin to operate in the realm of God's unmerited favor. And why is this important? Because we meet so much that is being taught today. That is not aligned to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But because he died, because he met all the requirements of the law of God, because he has purchased for us once and for all our redemption, we now stand before the Father in him, not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness of God purchased for us through Jesus Christ. We stand with him, him being our mediator with God. So when he says we come into this grace, or we have introduction into this grace, or we have access into this grace, he doesn't end it there. He says in which we stand. Basically, you are not shuttling between that grace and out of that grace. So, so it is not you are communing there and moving out of there. No. He says you have access into this grace, into this presence where you have come through the Lord Jesus Christ by one spirit to the Father. And he says, you stand right there. So nobody is ushering you out. I remember what before I came to the faith. I was attending this religious function. And uh, it was a big occasion. And uh, we came in early because it was a big occasion. And in the session of, of worship, here comes this dignitary. So the archers now begin to see who is not worthy to be there. And I happen to be one of those that were pointed out. So I was told to vacate my seat. And I was taken outside. And so the dignitary who walked in late took my seat. But I thank God that all was not lost. 
Because when I went out, then I heard the music that was coming from elsewhere. And I went there. And I found the Asha at the entrance. And she ushered us into the presence. Into the sanctuary. And it is there that I met Jesus Christ. It is there that I had the introduction. Why? Because access was granted. So, when bringing it back to where we were, when the Bible says, we have access into this grace. When you come into this grace, there is no no Asha to take you out. <laughs> there is no Asha to say, no, how did you ever get here? There, there is no one who is saying, but you don't look like the rest. There, there is no one who is consulting your background to say, but wait a minute, your background does not allow you to be here. The scripture tells us that as many as received him, to them he gave the power. He gave the exousia. He gave the right. He gave the authority to become the children of God. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, there is no distinction. There are no classes. God does not have stepchildren. God does not have grandchildren. God does not have great grandchildren. In Christ Jesus, we become the children of God. And understanding that we now stand into this grace, this presence of God, God, where no one is pulling us out of. It is this grace that we stand in, which is the saving grace. It is this grace where we are the elect of God. It is this grace where we now come through to our predestination. This is redeeming grace. This is regenerating grace. This is sanctifying grace. This is the grace that secures us. So we have access by faith in Jesus Christ. Why is that so? Because he says in Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So you and I are God's work of art. You are part of his grand design. Created in Christ Jesus. Here he uses the word create. He doesn't use the word refurbish. He doesn't use the word panobitim. He doesn't say repaired. The word he uses is the word create. Which means there is a part of you that now exists that did not exist before. There is a part reborn. There is an aspect of your life that has been reborn spiritually from above. So you have now been renewed. You have now been transformed. You have now been made ready for use. Like he says in the Amplified Version. And this you are made ready for use for good works. Which God 
prepared. So you are not here by accident. You are here because there is a purpose to fulfill. You are here because before God put you here, before he created you in Christ Jesus, he had put and set everything up. Let me put it this way. God is not setting you up for failure. God has set you up. For good works. God has set you up to succeed. And he has prepared this beforehand. So that you should walk in them. I, I love how the Amplified concludes this. Amplified it says living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. That's why he in another portion of scripture, Paul emphasizes and says to us, he says, what no eye has seen, what ear has not heard, what has not entered into the heart of man, that is what God has prepared for those that love him. God already has a plan. It is beyond your widest imagination. God has a purpose for your life. And it is grand. It does not look like where you are coming from. It doesn't look like what you have gone through. It does not look like even your widest imaginations. God has a plan for your life. And when we access his very presence, when we access this grace in which we stand, we have access not only to God's presence, not only to his person, but we we'll also have access to the plans that he has for our lives. And that's why fellowship with God is so important. That's why fellowship with the Father is not something we do once in a while. When we come into this position, this access that he has given us, I said we are operating in a realm that is unknown to us. This is what Jesus talks about. When he says in the book of John, chapter 15, where he compares himself to the vine and we to the branches. In verse 7, he says, if I abide in you and my words abide in you, not just his person, but also his words abiding in us. So what that means, we come into this place and we are not departing from it. Stay right there. That's where everything is. Then he says, you will ask. And whatever you desire, because his word abides in you. Everything aligns to God's purpose. God's desires become your desires. Then what you ask becomes what God desires that you ask. He says, ask anything. And it shall be given. It shall be done for you. It's not that you will do it. It shall be done to you. Why? Because this is a position of grace. It gives you what you don't deserve. Uh, let's go back a moment. 
Okay, to, the to the book of Ephesians and see what Paul tells us concerning how we get here. He talks to us as and gives us the position of where we are. In verse 11, he paints the picture for us. He explains to us that in the time past, we were separated from God. We were called the uncircumcision. We had no relationship with him. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We had no hope. We, have no, we had no God in this world. But I like what he says in verse 13. He says, but that changes everything. That removes all the gloom. That removes all this environment that is negative. He says, but now, not tomorrow, not next year. Not after you have prayed and fasted. Not after you have given the seed. He says, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Because of his shed blood, you who was a pharaoh has been brought near. You didn't draw yourself. You didn't come here because you fought principalities and powers. No. You are here because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of his blood, you have unfettered access to the presence of God. Into this place of grace. And it is in this grace that you stand. And he goes on to say, for he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, is our peace and our bond of unity. Christ becomes our peace and then unites the Jews and the Gentiles together. So all appear as one before God. Him being our peace, which takes us back to where we were and say through him we have peace with God. So we have peace with God through his blood. Why? He himself is our peace. And he tells us that he has brought these two groups together. Broken down the dividing wall. And he goes on to say that he came and preached peace to us. So where you stand now, you and I, who was a pharaoh? The Bible tells us in verse 19 that you are no longer a stranger. But I like what he says in verse 18. He says, for it is through him that we have a way to, of approach in one spirit to the Father. And that way is direct. That access we have to the Father is unhindered. There are no roadblocks around the way. It is a direct way. By the Spirit, through Jesus Christ, to the Father. So you and I now stand in a place of privilege. We stand in a place where we have access to the Father. It is not a one-time thing. This is perpetual. This is constant. This is spiritual. And 
let the Bible tell us then, like we saw earlier in Hebrews, that let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. It is not a throne of merit. It is not going there to be awarded for your achievements. It is a throne where you come without any worthiness. It is a throne where you come with nothing but faith in Jesus Christ. And you receive what he has to help you. And why is this important? Because we live in a time where we think that we need to go through someone or something to access God. But that's not what the scripture says. Look at what it says in Hebrews 7, verse 19. It says there in, in bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And in 25, he winds and says, therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. You see, we draw to God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he forever lives to make intercession for us. Now look at this. Even when it comes to intercession, in Romans, he says, 8.26, we don't know how to pray or to how to make our prayer worth it. But what, what happens? The Spirit himself makes intercession on our behalf. It is the Spirit of God who makes intercession on our behalf. Basically, it is the spirit that ushers you into the presence of God. So you are born into the presence of God. Or you are brought into the presence of God by the Spirit. I'm reminded of the book of Deuteronomy where he talks about the children of Israel bringing them into the land of promise and he says I bore you on wings like an eagle you did not get here on your own you got here because I carried you here it was not your merit it was my grace in the same way with us we have this access with God through Jesus Christ in whom we have access in this grace in which we stand and that's why he says in verse 19 of the book of Hebrews chapter 10 he says something important he says therefore brethren since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new and living way. A new. It did not exist before. It is a living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh since we have a great priest over the house of God let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith so we have this access 
Christ is a high priest making intercession for us before God. So we are not strangers to the presence of God. Why through his death, something important happened. Through his death, the Matthew tells us, chapter 27, verse 51, that when he died, he said the veil of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. That is very significant. Because what was happening here, you need to go back to the Old Testament to understand what it took to get to the presence of God. You will discover that there were divisions. On the outside, everybody would gather. Then the Jews would move to a certain section. So even there, they had to be separated, male and female. Then the priest would get into a certain place. So the people remained outside. It is only the priest that went to the place where sacrifices were made. Then to get into the most holy place, it is only the high priest who went. And you, he went there once to on the day of atonement. But look at what happened. The right away. So this is what happened then. And when they built the temple, they still had this veil. And it is only the priest that went beyond the veil. But look at what the writer of Hebrews has told us. He says we have a new and living way, which Christ inaugurated. And this way goes through the veil. So there is no veil anymore. Why? Because Matthew tells us in chapter 27 and verse 51 that when Christ died on the cross, the veil was torn into two from the top to the bottom. Why top to bottom? Why not bottom to top? Because if it is bottom to top, then it could be be an act of man. But this was from top to bottom. It was God doing away with the veil because of what Christ had done on the cross. So that everyone, those that were afar off, those that were outside the court, everyone now had access to the throne of grace. And he says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in assurance of faith. So you and I now have access to the Father and that speaks a lot to us concerning our prayer life. We do not need somebody to pray for us. You don't need matters and sins to pray for you. You have a privilege of accessing the presence of God. You have an intercessor with the Father. He is there for you. He is there to receive you. He is there to introduce you. He is there every moment, every day, every minute of your life. In the presence of God. It also speaks to us concerning worship. 
calling on us to continually be worshippers of God throughout our lives because we have access to the presence of God and it calls us to that fellowship that dynamic relationship with God where we abide in Christ and he in us and that is what we need to be cognizant of that having been justified by faith. We not only have peace with God, but through Jesus Christ, we have access into this grace in which we stand. Therefore, let me ask somebody that is listening and watching us today, have you received this Jesus Christ? If you have never, this is your moment. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say, God of heaven, creator of heaven and earth, I am a sinner who needs a savior in my life. Jesus, Yes. You are the savior of mankind. I believe that you died for my sins. And you rose again on the third day. Understanding before the Father. Interceding on my behalf. Lord, save me. Lord, cleanse me. Fill me with your spirit. And empower me to walk in this life according to the purpose that you have designed for her, according to the good works that you have prearranged that I will walk in them. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you say that prayer from your heart, you have been saved this very moment. Now for the saints, we have an application here. Prayer, praise and worship, and fellowship with the Father are yours as benefits of justification by faith. Apply them into your life and it will make all the difference to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for listening to us. From Dominion Church, it's been a pleasure to have you today. God richly bless you. Shalom.